this episode of Policy Talks, uh, we are in Bangalore and we are in the office of Egg Step and we are here with Shankar Maruwada, uh, co-founder of Egg Step. For those of you who don't know Egg Step, uh, it is one of the many digital public infrastructure. Uh, not many people classify it as in, under DPI and Shankar is one of the co-founders along with uh, Nandan and uh, Rohini Nilikani. Uh, and he has been at uh, basically trying to solve uh, the problem in the education space for a long time. Welcome to the show, uh, Shankar. Thank you, Yatish. Uh, good to finally have you in this seat. Uh, I know we had a conversation four years back uh, and uh, it was an informal conversation. I. I hoped I had recorded it then and, you know, kind of put it out. But there is still, uh, in the larger community of, say, technologists, policy makers, and um, researchers, the story of XTEP is not very well known. Uh, so tell us about the genesis of XTEP and what was the problem that you started off solving. The genesis of uh, XTEP Foundation was around 2014 when some of us came together and asked the question of what can be done to improve learning outcomes in education. We were not sure if that was the right question to go after. Mm -hmm. But after talking to a lot of people in the field and Rohini Nilekani's own philanthropic experience, she knew the sector very well. Nandan, myself and some of my other colleagues, we all came together from the early days of Aadhaar. Yeah, I know you are all founders, founding team, founded team of Aadhaar. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So we had a lived experience mm. of how do you imagine something at a massive scale. At a societal, societal scale. scale. And how do you implement it? So that you achieve those goals, you achieve it with the ecosystem already and you leverage technology to achieve it. So some of those principles we looked at in education also. Tell us those principles, those learned principles, okay. if there were. Yes. So the first was meet the problem at the scale it is. If Identity is a problem for 1.3 billion people. Think of starting off with that problem statement. So in Aadhaar it was, how do we reach 1.3 billion people in 10 years, 600 million in 5 years and 200 million in 3 years. So you're starting with the end goal in mind. In education, Eight Step Foundation, which we set up in 2015 once we were convinced, there were around 250 million children studying in schools then. And thanks to the wonderful efforts of all of India over the past three decades, we had largely solved the schooling problem. Yes, yeah, so people were getting into school. So, so one principle was that handle the problem at the level that the problem exists. So that's one principle yes. that you learned from Aadhaar. Yes. And which you are applying to at eight step. So 250 million students need to be, have better learning outcome. Is that Yes. So we defined our problem statement as Extra Foundation. How do we reach 200 million children by 2020 okay. and improve their access to learning opportunities? Okay. So improve their access to learning, learning opportunities. opportunities. I'll explain. So part of the problem is not just to deal with the problem at the scale it is at, but to give a sense of urgency and a specific timeline. Okay. So in Aadhaar, I told you the specific timelines. Mm -hmm. Here it became 200 million children by 2020. And we were in the year 2015. What that does is leads to the second question. This problem is so big and the deadlines are so close, we ourselves can't do it. So it's not a question of can Extep Foundation do it or not. It's a question of how does XTEP Foundation work with the existing ecosystem of, as Rohini calls it, Sarkar Samaj Bazaar, that is already trying to solve the problem, 
that is the only way we will reach 200 million children by 2020. Second. So, that is the second principle. Work with the ecosystem. Work with the ecosystem to solve the problem instead of solving it ourselves. So, work with the ecosystem. So, the ecosystem solves the problem. You enable or you help or you become the enabler or yeah. catalyst for that. Okay. Second problem. Great. Second, second principle. principle. Third principle. What people want, mm -hmm. go with that. What the end citizen wants, what the child wants, what the teacher wants, right? Go with where there is demand rather than going with necessarily what we think is the best solution. Wonderful. Okay. So, go with where the market demand is, not with what the solution potential is. Potential is. Very interesting. So, not market demand is a not-for-profit. With but what it people is still want. the market. Yeah. Still yeah. The, market. the market. The non paying market. You know, like it's the yeah. That is very important for us. Mm -hmm. And again, from Aadhaar, right? Why would someone need one more identity card? Right? Let the citizens decide. And once they wanted it, the dynamics changed. Mm -hmm. So that was the third principle. Leading with value. What people value. Okay. And fourth, technology can be a massive enabler. Technology can allow human individuals or as institutions to do things at that scale. they otherwise cannot do at scale. Okay. The case of Aadhaar, proving digital identity in an instant. Wonderful. What would that be in education? That was a fourth principle. So, setting an unachievable goal oh, in oh, an unachievable very time, ambitious. very ambitious goal, therefore, working with the ecosystem to make it happen, but working with the ecosystem to create something of value to the end users, where the currency of value is usage. Currency of is usage. They reward not by giving us money, we are a not-for-profit or Aadhaar which is government, but by using it, by adopting it. And fourth, how can technology enable all of this to happen? Understood. So, these were the four starting principles, if you will. And given it was education, which was very complex, we said we will take a very specific problem, early learning and foundational literacy and numeracy. So, that would be classes uh, first on first to third or? That is how we started, okay. till we realized that there are children in class 8 who have not yet achieved foundational literacy and numeracy. Yes. So, rather than focus on classes, we said foundational literacy and numeracy, it in might occur across. Irrespective of the yeah. class that student is in. So, automatically the uh, number of students and number of uh, people targeted in that increased. Yeah. So, then customization becomes difficult for… Because there is no one solution. Okay. So, tell us about the multiple solutions. Then. Yeah. So, out of 250 million children, we said maybe 200 million children, right? So, these are from K-12. So, what a child in kindergarten wants is different from what a child in grade 8 wants. Okay. Right. But the more we explore, we realize that it's not just about the child learning. Mm. A child is at the center of a universe that comprises parents, teachers, schools, headmasters, and other important things like textbooks, the school administration. Because ultimately, we do not send our children to a particular teacher, right? We send in the school. So. We trust the school. And why do we trust the school? Because there is oversight, there is governance, right? So, understanding this complex web mm. of interdependent actors made us realize that it's not just a question of a better technology delivered to the child. Mm -hmm. How do these actors around the child do so, their job better? So, I mean like the, how does the teacher do his job better? How does the headmaster or the principal enable the teacher or the student to do better? How does the student himself access some of this? 
how do you assess the child? How do you assess the child? How does a parent know what's happening to the child? Yeah. How does the parent monitor the progress? How does the parent maybe push the progress? Yeah. Uh, because fundamentally, unlike other problems we dealt with before, education is not completion of a transaction, mm. payment, proving ID, visit a doctor for a health checkup. Education is a multi-year journey, 15 years. And it's a, it's a complex process in itself. It's a social it process. Yeah. It's a? Social process. It's a social process. Okay. Yeah, it, it is a social process in the sense that a large, uh, as you said, large number of factors from the society are involved in that journey of learning. So, and the learning may happen with peers also. Which, and your environment influences your learning. Which is, yeah, which is large. So, I mean, like, they say that beyond K-12, most learning is peer learning. So. Also, the mahal in which you are growing up. Yeah. Right? A child growing up in a village, going to a private CBSC, certified affordable uh, uh, school similar child in bangalore going to a similar kind of school the mahal is different in both that influences so how did you uh, tackle this problem the ecosystem problem and the so i'm looking at two uh, buckets so yeah. to say the ecosystem and the technology yeah yeah so there's a technology solution which can sit on its own and there's a the larger ecosystem social problem that you yeah. have to tackle. Yeah. So, the third is the clock is ticking. We said 2015. So, you said five years. You said a ambitious target for yourself. 2020, yeah. right? The, the moment we try, understood this, tried out a lot of things, 2016, right? Yeah. We put some technology together. And the way we did it was try out a few things. Mm -hmm. Through the trial and error, do research on it, understand what is working, what is not working, reaction of various people. Talk to a whole range of ecosystem actors, including governments and not-for-profits and market players, academicians, people in India, abroad. Uh, all of this was happening. But the big breakthrough for us was asking the question, rather than look at it from a technology point of view, Given this wide and complex and very dense interconnected network of actors, instead of asking what is not there, ask what is there which is common to everybody. Which is? Common to everybody. What okay. unites this entire complex which ecosystem? Which is obviously the textbook. The textbook. <laughs> right? Okay. But I, I, I mean, I guessed it because you have a textbook. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So the humble textbook, <laughs> we re looked at it. As something that is distributed universally. Yes. Right? As something that in our Indian culture we respect. Absolutely. Yeah. Saraswati Indeed. Puja, yeah. once a year. Yeah. Right? It is held in high esteem. What if we could use that as a vehicle? As a vehicle to connect the physical to the digital? Okay. What if we use the physical textbook? as a gateway to digital content. But was this, I mean, did, how did you arrive at this conclusion? Was it, was there a, did you guys do some kind of brainstorming internally or this was somebody's magic? Uh, uh, no, such things are never anyone's magic thing. <laughs> it is, we did brainstorming, we did research, okay. we learned from it. We used to do melas internally, which is quickly hack ideas, okay. right? And from there figure out what is working. What is a mela? Like a regular mela you have, people put up stalls, that's Here right. we put up stalls about various ideas. So people would put up an idea and have others react to the idea. Okay. So instead of selling goods, we were selling ideas, ideas internally. So you actually put up a stall in the... In the yeah, this, uh, this build, uh, yeah. all floors here. Okay. So a, a table was a stall. So in one of those, while discussing, a thought came up that wouldn't it be cool when I'm on page 7 of a textbook, if there I could get digital content relevant to that. So let me show you this textbook. Yeah. This is a biology class 10 textbook published by the government of Andhra Pradesh. Yeah. So it's a state board textbook for any... Yeah, it could Andhra. be, you know, every state produces its own textbook. Yeah. Right? Now I'm a class 10 student. I'm on page 38. Yeah. The topic I'm reading is respiration versus combustion. Yeah. 
And just turn it around for me. Right. To see. Yeah. Respiration versus combustion. Okay. So there's a QR code there. Now, at this point, I want to know. I wish I could see a video of the differences between the two, or I wish I could be given five questions which answers, or I wish to know something more about it. Okay. But I'm limited by the textbook. Yeah. The teacher is limited by the textbook. Yeah. The system is limited by the textbook because this is given free. Yeah. At that point, there's a small digital window through which I could enter. Where does get, it take me? It takes me to digital content, which is relevant to this. Prepared by whom? The same guys who, who I trust. Oh, the, 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 the state board will prepare a digital content and host it? Yeah. No, so this was the idea. Mm. This was the idea that came up in the Mela. Mm. Right? Mm. Now, but the question was, how do we do this for 250 million children? Mm. Right? And when you think that, the way you design for it is different. So what happened was, around the time we were thinking of this, the government of India had reached out. We were discussing with them because they wanted our help in setting up a, at that time it was a national teacher platform. Mm. But later on that became Diksha, a school platform. Okay. So as part of various conversations, this idea we are thinking about. This QR code as a window to digital content. library. As an idea became part, is what Diksha is? Is one of the solutions in Diksha. Okay. But that came later. This we tried out with three states, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh. Which year was this? 2018. 18. 2018 early, 17 and 18 early. They implemented it. And then it was implemented on Diksha. Okay. And therefore this infrastructure or this digital public infrastructure was made available by Diksha, the national platform that belonged to the government of India to all states. Okay. So therefore, as a digital public infrastructure, any state could sign up on Diksha. Upload their content. No, first as a result they get to place QR code. Each QR code has a unique number. Ah. Right? So they decide where in their existing textbooks. You see, here, government of Andhra Pradesh decided to have two, two QR codes in the same page. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But government of Maharashtra, Marathi, Bal Bharti, grade four, yeah. decided to have it, say, about this poem, yeah. with a QR code. What is in a poem? Don't we learn better mm. if someone recited that poem? Mm. Oh, so it's uh, okay. So it goes to a digital uh, I mean, a URL where a recitation of the poem is happening. It goes to a digital content mm. where it could be in this case an experiment being shown mm. or a video or in this case a video. Somebody is uh, reciting, reciting the video. It. So you get both the pronunciation and the incantation yeah. of the poem yeah. in that sense. Yeah. But it could also, after you watch the video, it could ask a question. What do you think was the emotion of the author? What was the author trying to convey? You know, I still remember my poem questions. Yes, <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. And the, the difficulty of how do I know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> in biology, yes. after you understood difference between respiration and combustion, and asking you three questions, mm. right? And your answer would tell you that have I really understood or not. So, you, you, you mentioned, you know, when we were talking earlier that Sunbird was the vehicle which created one plat platform that got embedded in Diksha, which is a government-owned platform, which allows any state to create, upload their or, or create QR codes inside all their textbooks, irrespective of the language, irrespective of uh, the subject, subject and grade and, and all that. Yeah. So it, 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 for, a, for somebody who does not understand technology, just walk us through this so-called two building blocks that you talked mm -hmm. about. Yeah. So while Diksha 
more and more states were coming on to Diksha for this, right? Yeah. Yeah. What was Diksha built on? Mm. Diksha belonged to the government of India, mm. but for Diksha to be built, we created something called Sunbird, okay. which allowed platforms like Diksha to be built. Sunbird is again a non-profit organization or is it no, a platform? No, Sunbird is a, a technology. It's a platform. Is a, is a technology, technology, like you have Linux. Oh, right? it's an operating system kind of. Uh, yeah, it's an open source technology okay. through which you can create various platforms. So it's code. It's freely available. If you go to GitHub, you can download the full code. So is it like a backend protocol which allows you to build other platforms or is it uh, like a operating software? Think of it as uh, more like Linux open source. Okay. Linux allows you to create operating systems. Mm. So whether it is Mac OS or Chrome OS, okay. they are both built on Linux. Because Linux is an open source, anyone so can take it. Sunbird is a, like an OS for the education content management space. Yeah. Is that the right definition? Partly. Okay. Because that's how it began. Mm. But we had designed it as a set of building blocks, okay. like Lego blocks. Okay. The first few Lego blocks was around QR codes. Okay. That means one Lego block allowed you to connect. A QR code in a textbook to a digital uh, content. Yes. Okay. Right. Another QR, another building block allowed you to create the digital content. Okay. Creation. Another building block allowed you to consume that content via an app or a portal. Okay. Another building block gave you the data of all the creation, all the consumption. Analytics. Analytics. Your favorite. Yes. Starting point. Yes. <laughs> Another building block gave you the ability to create a taxonomy to link a topic and a subject to content. Oh, across grades? Across grades. Oh, so that means it kind of gives you a knowledge graph of sorts. Knowledge graph. So the building block is a knowledge graph. It's called knowledge, sunbird knowledge. Okay. And it right. creates a graph of sorts. Yeah. Like a mind map of, you know. Exactly. Uh, so all of these were created as various So I, Suppose I was in 8th class and I have forgotten something that I read in 6th class. I can go through that knowledge graph backwards or forwards. Yes. Right. Depending upon the application. Depending on the application. In Diksha for QR code, a certain application was used. Right. But what you are saying is absolutely possible. That requires a, a different app to be used. So what is the app? What is the name of the app? Is it in Diksha, the app is called Diksha also. Okay. Right. What does it have? When you go there, it asks, are you a teacher or a parent or a uh, student. student? If you're a student, then it starts giving you content relevant to you. But you could also use your textbook, use the QR code and go directly to the content referred here. Except there will not there will not be one piece of content, there might be seven, eight pieces of content. There might actually be a digital textbook there. So, I mean, how does this compare to what the edtechs are offering? Yeah. The biggest difference is this was thought of as a digital public infrastructure, yes, which means so it is free. That means that's it's free. But essentially, what Diksha does with QR codes is allows each state to create their own content. So customization at state level by the state board. Yeah, connected to their own textbooks. Connected to their own textbooks. Right. So it's not one edtech where the government of India is providing content. It is different state boards providing their content. That's why it's an infrastructure. Okay. Yes. Which others used. So every state board think of them as ha having their own car. Hmm. The government of India is providing the road. Each state is coming up with its own car. Okay. So that's why the digital public infrastructure and that was the choice we made that the only way to reach 200 million by 2020 was to create digital public infrastructure by partnering with others, in this case government of India and various states. State boards. 
state boards and partnering with NGOs who had great content. Oh, okay. Who provided the content for Diksha. Give us some examples. Uh, Tata Trust provided content, Khan Academy provided content, Akshara Foundation provided math content, interactive math games. Then uh, uh, Pratham provided content for foundational learning. Okay. Other philanthropies like Central Square Foundation, yeah. they funded the creation of high quality content called Tic Tac Learn, okay. which was made available on Diksha. So do you see how we are engaging the ecosystem? Yeah, yeah, interesting, yeah. Right? And every state could work with the NGOs of their choice. Mm. Government of Karnataka worked with Akshara Foundation. Government of UP worked with an NGO called Learning, uh, Language Learning Foundation. Okay. Because states are anyway working with certain NGOs. Yeah. Every state has its own SCRT its own academic experts. Rajasthan asked its teachers to create content. Oh, okay. And different districts were identified who were good in certain subjects. The teachers were asked to create content. Some states held workshops for teachers who then created content. So 2016, you said three states signed up. 2017 late, 18 early. 17 late. So it's been three, five years, six years now. No, it was much faster. So by 2018, June, seven states had signed up. And consolidated number in 2000. By 2019, 15 states. So by 2019. And why did this happen so fast in your opinion? Yeah. Typically, a decision of a state board of this nature you know, curriculum decisions takes multi years yeah. to take place. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In fact, by the time pandemic came, mm. 2020, 28 states and union territories had already on Diksha. Question is why? States anyway published textbooks. Yeah. They saw what some of the early states had done. By the way, after Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, and Andhra Pradesh, mm. the next states where Jammu and Kashmir, Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan oh, Uttar Pradesh, and Assam. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. Right? Yes. So what the central government did was say that, hey, look, these states are already adopting. Hmm. Here is a package on how you can adopt if you want to. So there was almost like a, you know, how to adopt, how to do it, guide right. for them. A playbook, hmm. right? Technical resourcing, hmm. uh, a project management unit was created. Under the government. Under the government of India. And Xstep Foundation was part of that project management unit. Right. Central Square was also, Foundation was also there. There were others. So the answer to the question is, the design of this was made in what Xstep Foundation calls as a plus one mode. Current actors are already doing things. So the design involved in understanding what they're already doing and understanding what's the smallest amount of change I can induce, mm. which is transformative. So textbooks are already being produced. It's already being printed. Only thing being added by the printer is, is a QR, QR code. code. So small change. Small change. But the behind that small change is a, is a long process in terms of connecting that QR code to the content, yeah. creating that content. Uh, monitoring the usage of that content. Uh, All done by institutions that are already supposed to, already doing that. Yeah. SCRTs exist. They are anyway looking for digital content. So it's understanding how does the ecosystem work. Making design. So if, suppose if this was done by a private enterprise and not by a non-profit or a organization like the extent. Yeah. How, how do you think the approach would have changed? Say a for-profit does things to improve its value, yeah. right? It offers value. As a result, it increases its value. Absolutely. So if a for-profit had done it, the intellectual property would have been theirs. Would have been the for-profit, yes. They would have said, we'll offer everything to you end-to-end. -end. 
that is a ed tech approach yes the default ed tech approach mm. i will take care of this problem for you mm. i will provide you great content in some cases i'll provide you devices i'll sell you the devices i'll sell you the devices or they sell the device to the student yes or i'll sell you the content the data comes to me so i know what they are using and and therefore i can provide better services yeah right yeah. here the data belongs to the states the content belongs to the states the intellectual property belongs, belongs to the states, states. right so and so therefore what is the cost and who bears the cost so the one component of the cost is running the platform who, yeah right that the government of india bears which is diksha diksha right second component is creating digital content which if the states want they source it or if they want they can buy it or if they want they can get it from ngos okay okay but some states have decided to give devices to children like okay. tamil nadu like maharashtra decided to put up smart tvs in schools the schools so hardware cost some states went ahead with capacity building of their teachers to use this better and to create better content some states focused only on the early grades initially maharashtra example said all grades all subjects oh really okay rajasthan in the beginning said that we will start with two grades two subjects and then we'll see so do you see it's not one size fits all the default model going back to the edtech thing is show something is working then scale it up to everybody same okay now solution so, yeah everybody it's yeah. what we call a scale what works yeah yeah now this is interesting now now let, let's this, the technology offers fair bit of uh, customization personalization ai offers uh, enormous potential of possibility right and every ed tech in the country is kind of you know uh, launching some thing which is enabling that personalization and every child does learn differently we know that yeah. we know that every child some child learn through visual some specially some uh, maybe through music through music and then sometimes you you go backwards forward sideways yeah. uh, to learn and ai can do that so is there i mean now you are at how many states diksha is in all pretty much all states pretty much so, so is there a next uh, uh, version of diksha which is yes and uh, to tell us a little bit about who runs diksha in the government yes. and uh, what is the interface of ek step or csf organization with yeah. that right so when diksha was started ek step csf were part of a project management unit okay that was set up by the ministry of education ncrt was the nodal body for running diksha okay ek step was providing technical assistance to ncrt okay <coughs> as the platform became mature ncrt then handed over diksha to digital india corporation okay dic which is a government agency yes. to run it okay. so dic runs it ncrt is a nodal agency it comes under the ministry funds etc ek step provides technical assistance to dic or to dic now okay or ncrt depending upon their requirements so after the success of qr code and you know there was a rapid spike and all the states took it and it's the first time in india that such fast adoption was happening give us a context to the adoption so by around 2020 mm -hmm. the reach of this was close to 180 million children 180 million in how so, many years 2000 over 3 years so they say that uh, netflix and chat gpt are the fastest adoption in the private enterprise space 
Yes. No, those would still be faster. They'll be faster. Because this is reach. Usage was is a subset of this. Okay. Because a textbook with QR code might reach, but the child may not have a device at home. Ah, so that means they'll only watch it in school or when the teacher shows it or with their parents. So this was reach. But to give you a sense, during pandemic, Diksha was for several weeks the number one app and consistently in the top five in a consideration set that had Baiju's and Vedantu, etc. Right? Even though this was mostly meant for government schools. Private schools also? Private schools also, but uh, a lot of the state boards are government schools, right? Yeah. The only private schools would be CBSE run schools. CBSE or ICSE. So the CBSE schools have the embedded QR codes now? Yeah. So if all Kendri Vidyalayas, all Central School, yeah. Navodhya Vidyalayas. Uh, they're using NCRT books. Because they're using NCRT, NCRT books, right. So the ICSCs don't have it. Yeah, that's their choice. Yeah. Because okay. they, they may not, not have it. Okay. They may not have so it. So in a sense, they're behind the curve. That's one way of looking at it. That's <laughs> why I'm not looking at it. Yeah. But going back to your question, when the QR codes took off, yeah. when pandemic hit, schooling was closed, but learning continued. Yes. Right? And through WhatsApp, etc., teachers would pass on messages that, you know, now read this, watch the QR code if you have. Yes. So, lot of states and the teachers did phenomenal work. But as a result of schooling stopping, teacher training also stopped. Yeah. Right? And more than technology, it's the role of the teacher that's more important. Yeah. It's the teacher who personalizes things for you. Yeah. Right? So, teacher training, which was a vital component, suddenly stopped. So like QR code, the next big solution was online training of teachers. Which is what the original aim of Diksha was. The original aim. So, so that happened during the pandemic. Pandemic. And what was the role of AXTREP and... So we created on Sunbird the building blocks what which you? enabled Diksha to offer online courses like QR code, NCRT launched a program called Nishtha. Okay. They already had a program called Nishtha. Mm -hmm. The previous year, they launched it as a face-to-face -face training. This year, they could not do face-to-face, -face, so they switched to online training. But because it's online, teachers could complete it at their convenience at home. NCRT or the states who were doing the training, they got data about how the teachers were using it or how they were using it. Was it, was it compulsory for them to use it? Did they make it? In some cases, it was compulsory because Nishta was compulsory. Okay. Because NEP, National Education Policy 2020, specifies that teachers have to undergo 50 hours of training a year. It's part of the policy, right? Mm -hmm. So Nishta online training became part of that. And various models were, modules were created. Again, the same thing. Different states could create their own, take the NCRT thing, modify it in the local language. Over three years, and I think Nishta 1, Nishta 2, Nishta 3, Nishta 4 have been completed. Around 7 million teachers have completed 130 million courses. Give us in terms of number of hours spent on the platform. Uh, so on Diksha, if you take learning plus teaching courses, around 61 billion minutes of learning uh, have happened. You compare it with, say, S S Salman Khan, uh, sorry, Khan Academy, <laughs> uh, uh, or uh, Baiju's. Uh, I won't, they, they, they numbers may not be public. Khan Academy's numbers are public? Do I, okay. Yeah. Well, do, is there any comparative thing for this? Uh, uh, it might be of the same order as Khan Academy. So, but that's a global platform? That's a global platform. And it's been around for almost 15 odd years or more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this but happened? I think more than comparison, Indian content, Indian languages under the control of the state board, right? Which is why edtech might not be the right the paradigm. To compare it with? Yeah, because edtech means one solution deployed one way. You can take it if you want. Yeah, but yeah, they, 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 they customize it in, at least around languages and, yeah. and around state board content yeah. too. So 
Now with Nishta, what was proven was online training. Now what happened or is happening, districts are creating their own online training. On Nishta? On Diksha. Okay. Nishta is a government of India program. Okay. NCRT is rolling okay. it out. So states are now given the freedom for districts. To districts. But do the districts have this capacity? Yeah. Because yeah. we have diets, na? the district institute of education and training. We have also no, I didn't know they were functional. Well, they may not be as functional as they can be, but they are functional. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, teachers are saying, why should we wait only for national training? Mm -hmm. We know we have a certain need. And this came bottom up from the teachers. But is this uh, usage uh, in any way actually has improved learning outcomes uh, in say Pratham study or any other study? Yeah. You know your original, original goal. Yeah. yeah. Problem statement. Yeah. Yeah. Remember pandemic came in between? Yes. So there was a, so World Bank measures something called as learning poverty. Mm. The higher the score, the worse of a country is. So India was around 54 or so in the learning poverty pre-pandemic 2019. World Bank estimated as per the internal studies that that number should plummet to 70 because of schools Access being shut. To school going. For close to two years we were shut. But they were surprised when they did the survey in 2022, mm -hmm. uh, it just dropped slightly in India to 56 or 57. Oh really? That's a very small drop. This data exists. Okay. World Bank believes a large part of it is the way India used technology at scale and credits Which Diksha. Which is this report for World Bank you're referring to? If somebody so wants if you to go to the website, it. it's called uh, uh, Learning Poverty Research. Okay. Uh, and uh, in fact, Shabnam Sinha, India lead specialist, mm. she was uh, telling in a podcast which I was there with, uh, and I think that podcast is due for release, where as a result of their internal studies, they believe that Diksha had a significant role to play in arresting this loss. We will try to give you a link of this study in the uh, uh, podcast itself. Yes. So, uh, as part of learning poverty, every country comes up with its own research and with own uh, uh, articulation of it. So that was encouraging because we had not done any such research. To answer your question, has India's learning outcome improved? Not yet. Could it have gotten much worse? Yes. Is it only because of Diksha? May not be. Because India also launched its national education policy. It launched the Nippon Bharat mission. Mm -hmm. It launched the Nishta online training. And every state came up with their own COVID managing mechanisms, lot of effort went in. Yeah. So it again goes back to our central thesis that education, in education, it is people who play the more important role. The ecosystem plays its own. Technology is an enabler. To that ecosystem. So Diksha had two big use cases, children learning. And teacher training. Teacher training. A third use case came up, which is assessing children. Oh, really? Assessment is part of? Okay. Not because of Diksha, mm. but children are assessed in the normal way, pen and paper. Yeah, yeah. But the results of that can be quickly digitized yeah. okay. using something called Saral, which is an AI based tool that. OCR based technology. Kind of. Yeah. It's, yeah. Except OCR, it is artificial intelligence that recognizes your handwriting. Yeah. I mean, but it's, it, it, you take a picture of that and the AI. Yeah, yeah, does it 80-90% of the time. So that solution is built by whom? That layer? Again, X-Step built it. It's called Saral. It's called, when was this built? Uh, I think 2020, yeah, 2020. Okay. During, it was built uh, before the pandemic, but deployed during pandemic. Was it, oh, it's deployed, I mean. Yeah. In so, all the state boards? Or? No, no, not all. So two state boards are deploying it heavily. One is Gujarat, other is Uttar Pradesh. And Uttar Pradesh is deploying it at a state district level. Mm. And Assam deployed it for foundational literacy. But again, to give you a sense, this is another building block. 
states can use it for assessment. Another building block was a micro improvement project, mm -hmm. which was every school and every teacher can select a project that they want to do, let us say a reading campaign in that week mm -hmm. or improving the school facil facilities like painting the school mm -hmm. or a cleanliness drive, whatever is a micro improvement. Mm -hmm. This was first created as a building block on Sunbird mm -hmm. by Shiksha Lokam, another NGO. Shiksha? An Shiksha Lokam, it is another foundation. They contributed this building block to Sunbird. This building block was used by the government of India on Diksha. The program was called uh, Vidya Amrit. Who launched it? The education minister. Okay. Being used in various states. Vidya Amrit Mahotsa was what they called it. So that is again another program. The point I am telling is if one looks at it from an edtech solution, each of this could be one more, one more solution. Mm. But when you look at it from an infrastructure, every state and every school can decide what micro improvement project, every state can decide how to use the assessment infrastructure, every district can decide how to use the training infrastructure, which again goes back to those four points. To reach 200 million by 2020, it takes the whole ecosystem lead with what people find value and use it and make technology an enabler. So, you know, coming to the subtle part of it, so if assessment is digitized, uh, we will not have to depend on a Pratham survey to understand the learning outcomes because we would have at least the assessment digitized and standardized and uh, uh, existing as a data component. So, we would actually have real time data to um, understand what the learning outcomes are. In theory. In theory. In theory, right. Another way is Pratham can themselves use this to quickly figure out what is yes. happening. Yes, I mean like so they, they will just do the data analytics on it and say yeah. that you know this is what has happened. Yeah. So, that means you are, but the, you see surveys are always sample based. Yeah. This, is, this can be census based. This is this which is, is what is happening. Data yeah, sense. which is what is happening in Uttar Pradesh. Yeah. 1.3 crore children. So they have data for 1.3 crore children now. At a they district level. At district level? What do you because mean? the tests are done at a district level, right? So yeah, they have one data of 1.3 crore children. Mm -hmm. So effectively they have the largest sample size in the world, you know? Yeah, at 1.3 crore. Yeah, it is the largest it sample is. size. It is. Unless it will go up to something like SAT or something like or that. Or maybe China might have some. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And UP is just beginning. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but all of this, it is depends upon which state, what policies and what leadership makes them want to pick up something and do. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, 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 potential is enormous in terms enormous. of mapping uh, the outcomes and then, because if you have the outcomes, if you have monitored the outcome at uh, state level or uh, country level, then you know where the intervention has to be, yeah. you know, which district, which school, you know, you can write down, go down to the student level. Yeah. You know? Which l learning topic? Uh, yes. So, both learning topic and student, so then personalization, customization can happen, there. Can happen yeah. with technology much better in that sense. Respecting the human factor. Yeah, yeah. So, if you have a district. So are you excited by the potential of it? Oh, yeah. Especially when you add now AI. Yeah. So, right. so how exciting is that potential? Yeah. So, before coming to AI, mm -hmm. the way we had designed it, because we are a philanthropic organization, everything we do is in the public open source, meant for anyone to use. Yeah. We do not earn any revenue. Yeah. In 2019, we met Prime Minister Modi and he was reviewing the progress of Diksha. So, he asked Nandan, can you build something, can you help us build something like Diksha for civil servants? In fact, it is mentioned in that book, 20 years of Modi, yeah, where yeah, Nandan yeah, talks yeah, about yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this. I got. Uh, right? So, that became I got. Similarly, last year, agriculture ministry wanted, can we have a Diksha for our agriculture for farmers? They are working with digital green. 
So you see how and that is why we call the origin story of egg step foundation as a story of a seed becoming a forest. Right. Yeah, I saw that. Um, I saw that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. We, the, the we, interesting. Uh, we released it early you, this year. Yeah. Well, In fact, uh, Yatish is inspired by a poem you might remember. Yeah. Makhanlal Chaturvedi, Pushpa Ki Abhilasha. Ah, yes. Uh, yeah. I, I Chaha that. nahi mein. Uh, uh, right. Right. We so, okay. Par, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, right. So, what if the ambition of the seed is not just to become a tree and to propagate more trees, but to become part of a large forest, where there are trees of different types, animals of different types, birds of different types, right? That is a forest. Yeah. Homogeneity is never a forest. Homogeneity is never a forest. It's a plantation. Yeah. A tea plantation yeah, yeah. is not a forest. <laughs> is not a forest. Yeah. So that uh, the, the most interesting thing about the forest is that forest does not have to be maintained, the forest does not have to be watered, the forest does not need fertilizer, the forest it exists itself. It sustains. Sustain itself. Why was this important and the sunbird approach? Mm -hmm. During the pandemic, we created Covin. Covin needed a small component of how do I verify that you actually got your yeah. certificate, right? Yeah. That's, That's why right. our Covin certificates have a big QR code. What's the origin of that? Oh, it was the QR code, but oh. oh. So the COVID certification also got inspired by the QR code. Not inspired. Mm. This code was reused. Oh, oh. Why would you need to create something when it exists? It's open source. Oh. So the people who created COVID, so, yeah, yeah. that's a uh, right, they cut first created something called DIVOC. DIVOC had many components. DIVOC, D D I V O C. Okay. Digital vaccination, something. It's a, uh, that had two components which came directly from here. So you see as a country, how we responded fast to a crisis by taking what existed, right? Now, therefore, a bit of sunbird is in 1.3 billion people. Yeah. Everybody who has a COVID yeah. certificate, yeah. right? I've taken a thanks to something that sunbird yeah. built. See it becoming a forest. We didn't intend it, yeah. but because it was out there, others could take and build off it. Which is an interesting way of encapsulating the, you know, the philosophy of open source in an Indian manner. You know, so if you look at the original founders of the open source, you know, people like Richard Stallman and all, they always said that um, it's a philosophy and a thinking. We are not building a solution or a technology stack. You know. Uh, we are teaching you a way of thinking that could be used or overused or multiple used. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Especially for a country like India that has so many aspirations yet so many problems to deal with. Mm -hmm. We can't be solving for each problem by recreating the same thing again and again. Yeah. yeah. Right. Wasting resources. Wasting resources. Right. So AI. AI. Therefore now coming to AI. Mm -hmm. So while all of this was happening Right? We realized that AI things were developing very, very fast. Mm. But there again, we focused on a problem that is unique to India, languages. Mm. Our languages have become a source of division. Yeah. Can, that be, can there be bridges where it does not matter if I speak Bengali, you speak Telugu, we can still transact and do our thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, Therefore, around two, three years ago, we started working on AI and how can you create it as a public good? How can you create as a Which year you started? Around 2021. 21. Okay. Then we realized that a group in IIT Madras was doing some wonderful work around language, Indian language, right. and they were thinking of building that as open source. So then we funded them. It is a center called AI for Bharat. And then we also partnered with the Ministry of Information Technology as part of another national project called Project Bhashini. Bhashini, yeah, 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 multiple language. Right. So we invested in AI in the context of Indian languages. Okay. So that was happening. And then, of course, Chat GPT came, right? 
Now the question is, is generative AI disruptive in education? We feel so. How will it disrupt? What will disrupt? How do you go about it? Those are the conversations that are still happening. And uh, therefore, even the Ministry of Education and others are asking, can we leverage the developments in generative AI to improve Diksha, to improve quality of content? And those are the conversations that are happening. So when chat GPT burst on the scene late last year, it obviously caused a lot of excitement, a lot of questions. And uh, uh, the conversations became, how can this be leveraged? How should this be leveraged? What are some of the dangers and downsides? And a lot of experiments started, right? Obviously, a lot of chatbots. And I'll give you some examples of the work that's happening. Suppose you have a big policy document. Mm. Remembering a 300-page document is not easy. Mm. But suppose you could converse with a chatbot. How would that be? So that was proven to be useful. Another example, suppose you have a book on teaching learning materials, which says that what activity to do with what materials to achieve what outcomes. Again, there's a big list is there. But suppose I start by asking the question to the bot. Suppose I have a rope and a ball. What activities can I do with it? Really? Okay. It lives That's down. That's an abstract question. No, but it got trained on the book, right? Uh, so this exists where it lists down the seven activities you can do and which page of that book you can go to read up more about the activity. Oh, okay. okay. So, yeah, you, so you're training the bot on a specific uh, uh, content and the bot is then answering it as a Q&A. Yeah. yeah, because you trained it on that policy document, yeah. you trained it on that book and now you're using it in day-to-day -day life. I want to teach division what activities can i do so it can give you right personalizing for the teacher's context yeah okay right i have 10 minutes what activity can i do quickly that involves clay now what is the current option you should have remembered it or somehow figure out if it's soft copy, find out clay and then do it, right? But in this case, you're asking a question, it gives an answer. It is still not an authoritative answer. It will point you back to the book. So it has both elements. It will give you an answer and it will also give you to uh, look at the exact thing. You, so yeah, yeah, a kind of qualified search yeah. in that sense. Yeah. Some other examples that we are playing around with and, and kind of showcasing it. Mothers like telling stories to their children. Suppose something happens and the child says, Wo share ki kahani mm. at that point you are like, I wish I knew the story. Right? <laughs> so there was an incident yesterday yeah. where at a stall where this was shown, mm. somebody came and said, tell me a story that involves a waterfall and it should be Indian context. Mm. It gave a story. So I take the story and tell my child. You see how my relationship with my child has suddenly changed. Yeah, yeah. Storytelling is a, such a great way of building bonds Bonding. with the child. Yeah. Right. So it's not what technology does, it's what I do with technology to improve my life. So we believe that is where the real potential of generative AI is. So this generative AI project, what is the name? How, how is it structured? Where does it exist? No, so we are, as Extra Foundation, doing a bunch of experiments. We are again partnering with various people and seeing who wants, who sees value in what. Some people are seeing value in the policy. Some people are seeing value in the story, right? Now, these innovations, once they are proven, can find their way on a mass India distribution channel like Diksha. But which should work, how should it work, that will involve the on, uh, ongoing series of experimentation. A state like Tamil Nadu has already taken some of these language learning and is deploying it for a statewide effort to improve their children learning Tamil and their children learning English. It's early days, 
because that's an initiative of the state of Cross Tamil Nadu. language learning is okay. Yeah. So every state or every institution or every organization will pick it up differently. And that is part of the larger homogeneity. But as the XTEP Foundation, we believe that we can and we have to take advantage of the disruptive nature of generative AI. So, so if you were to kind of, you know, look at the next five years and say that, you know, these are the things that would change and these are the things um, you, know, you guys could enable the change, as you said in your founding principles, which one of them could it be? Yeah. So at one level, we are still not yet complete on the task of improving learning outcomes. We see that as maybe it might go all the way till 2030. New policy is needed, capacity building of teachers, new content, right? Technology will keep on improving. So that's one large piece. Second, the ideas and the digital public infrastructure have gone beyond education yeah. in India. Yeah. Agriculture, urban governance, training, yeah. uh, uh, civil servants training, and it will go into many others. Third, because of AI, there will be a lot of disruption. For example, instead of a teacher undergoing four-hour training, taking detailed notes and referring to it when needed, an addition is, after doing all of this, a bot answers a quick query she has, yeah. which refers to the training. Yeah. Right. So, in some ways, I see generative AI as doing to the field of education services what the steam engine and electricity did to the industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. It just took it to a different plane. Mm -hmm. There it was about products. The way we manufactured products mm -hmm. changed yeah, so completely. The, you know, a, a way of using energy uh, in a form that could not be captured or stored or utilized. Uh, here, um, it is a form of energy actually. If you look at AI, uh, I do not see it as intelligence. It is a form of energy because uh, it consumes processing power and that processing power is just, um, in case of generative AI, it is just content or text, which video, image, yeah. whichever form you can look And that is now, right? Yeah. It is a way of delivering expertise. Yeah. It is a way of delivering services. Yeah. That will change dramatically, like the way steam and other energy sources change the way we manufactured and delivered products. Yeah. But that is a multi-decade journey. There are all the dangers of privacy and fake and yeah, out of control yeah. thing even, which yeah. we will have to manage. Even misuse of generative AI to pass examination. Yeah. Exactly. So that is there. The last thing that is exciting for us is last week Kenya, the government of Kenya was here. They are keen to take Sunbird and deploy it in Kenya oh, to create so. their own platform. Yeah. Likewise, there are other G20 countries that are talking to the Ministry of External Affairs, to the Ministry of Education. Mm. We also want our version of Diksha. And the government of India is saying, yeah, you can take the content or the code because Diksha is listed as one of the 12 digital public goods that the government of India is providing on its website. So if you go to indiastack.global, mm. Diksha is one of the 12 so that is there. Okay. So countries can take that or they can take Sunbird. So imagine if other countries benefit mm. from India's example, mm. right? Again, seed to forest. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who can stop the fragrance that's of good, the flower? That's a wonderful analogy. And thank you for that uh, great... Uh, explanation, uh, understanding of uh, this whole journey that you've been on. And uh, best of luck for your future endeavors, Shankar. Thank you. Thank you, Yatish. It's been an exciting journey, but uh, there's a long way still to go. The most, I guess the best part of the journey is uh, you're not walking alone. You're walking with the ecosystem, right? And that makes it, uh, even though tiring, it's a very fulfilling journey. Thank you.